And we are live, sir. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Mr. Vries of Fermilab, or my real name is Jerry Zerman. I'm a physicist here at Fermilab. Well, what you see behind me is not ET's uh, spaceship. It's actually a uh, old bubble chamber we've decommissioned. And I'm going to be showing you a video of a presentation I do for area schools in the Chicagoland area, uh, Fermilab's in Batavia, Illinois. And uh, so hopefully you'll enjoy the thing, and I'll be taking questions, maybe show you a little bit of cryogenics LN2 science at the end of that. The area of science that I worked in in particular is called cryogenics. Now, kids, cryogenics is not the science of crying. We know crying during the studies, but it is the science of extreme cold. But I just can't get to see. Before I start pushing around, I always like give you a chance to see that I'm working with. We sometimes refer to this stuff as liquid air, but since it's only a portion of the air, this is liquid nitrogen. That's it. It's just a cool liquid. In fact, if you didn't know that, it's actually very easy. Now, there's a few things that we noticed right off the bat that these seem a little different. Uh, first of all, what's the stuff coming up here? Even hot, what's this stuff? Oh, it's water vapor. Just like you see a breath of winter? Same effect, only this is caused by the fact that the liquid in the bag is so cold that it's connected to the water vapor out of the air around it. What's happening to the liquid in the bag? Bubbling. Bubbling till it's boiling. It's boiling because everything so hot that that everything makes it boil. My glove is so hot to that liquid, so my glove makes that liquid boil. Just like electric iron make water boil, my glove makes that liquid boil. We're well, going to help me out. If you want to know something, what do you have to do but ask the question? As I go through the show, I'm going to regularly go like this. What I want you to do is ask me the question, how cold is it? So let's give that a try. How cold is it? It's so cold, it makes a snowman shiver. It's so cold, it turns Smurfs blue. It's so cold, it thought the Arctic uh, vortex was a heat wave. Okay. What you actually need to know the temperature of something is the thermometer. And I have a thermometer here, about 70 in here, very nice. But I actually pour this liquid on my thermometer, so I actually measure the temperature. So I pour this liquid right on my thermometer like that. So I measure the temperature of the liquid really at. So, uh, liquid nitrogen is about uh, 45 degrees. <laughs> no, what happened? I, broke, I didn't break my thermometer. The thermometer is working just fine. What it's actually measuring is minus 320 degrees. That's how cold this liquid is in these containers. And because it is so cold, it has a very powerful effect on lots of things. Now, one of the first things that we noticed was that the liquid is boiling. Now, when you boil water, you get steam. This isn't water, it's nitrogen. So what am I gonna get when I boil nitrogen? Nitrogen gas, or basically air. So put a little bag, seal the bag up. What will happen is that bag will fill with nitrogen gas caused by the leak side expanding and filling that bag. So you make lots of gas. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess this bag really wasn't big enough for this job. So I'm probably gonna need a uh, bigger bag here. Oh, actually, uh, before I continue, I am gonna need a little help with some math. So I'm gonna give everybody a little mental math exercise. It's a very simple problem. Should be able to figure this out real easily. Now, I need to know how many seconds are, okay, seconds in a year. Seconds 
It's really easy. It's 12. Yeah, January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd, April 2nd. Or I thought about those other seconds. Oh, no, no. I thought it was leap year and had a second for no good reason. And, okay. So I got a bigger bag here. Now, one of the things I can be doing as I do this demonstration is scientific investigation. Now, investigation is what we call the expansion rate, or basically how much gas you get from a given amount of liquid. If I start with, say, one cup of liquid, how many cups of gas will you get? Well, the way to find out, of course, is you take one cup of liquid, you put it in your bag, you seal your bag up, and you'll see how many cups of gas you get for each one cup of liquid. Now, this is a good size bag, got lots of cups of gas. Kind of use this table here as a hot plate, warming it up for me here. There we go. He's cooking in there. So, so what do you think? Is that bag going to be big enough? So one cup of liquid convert a gas. No. So tell me, what do you do when you have a little scientific setback? Do you give up? Do you quit? No. no. You buy a bigger bag. So I have a bigger bag, and I repeat my experiment. Start with one cup of liquid again into the bag. Now, the good thing about this bag is that I know this bag is, in fact, a 45-gallon fresh bag. This bag here holds 45 gallons. But wait a second. I don't need to know how many gallons of gas I get. I need to know how many cups because I'm trying to make a ratio of cups to cups. So I guess I need to know how many cups are in 45 gallons. Uh, first, I need to know how many cups are in one gallon. So how many cups are in a gallon? 16 cups in a gallon. 45 gallons in the bag. Okay, 16 times 45. That's a little trickier. So is this bag going to be big enough? So one couple of you, convert to gas, 16, 9, 45, going once, you better hurry up. 16, 9, 45, going once. And the question, is this bag big enough? So one couple of you, convert to gas, 16, 9, 45. And the answer is yes. In fact, this bag is just big enough. So one couple of you, convert gas, the maximum number, for each one couple of you, you get 700 cups of gas. By the way, 16 times 45 is 720, so this bag is just big. Now that's fine, but the truth is that's not very convenient. It'd be much better if I actually uh, put it much better if I actually had a container I could hold it in. Now, because I am kind of the uh, clumsy sort here, I have to make sure I put a cork on that so I don't spill any of it. Is there a problem? Oh! <laughs> That, okay, that's what happened. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, this is kind of a neat way to demonstrate another principle of science. Is that something I kind of turn things around a bit and do it this way? <laughs> so, what principle of science is I trying to demonstrate here? Rocket propulsion. The reason why the bottle flies away because it is just like a rocket and cork comes up. But the truth is, that's still really not what we do. What we really do, this. What happens in this case? The bottle blows up. Yeah, in fact, I know somebody affirmed to that. They did this demonstration and the bottle blew up. It broke his nose. Good seats in front, right? I thought you said something about being really brave. And, uh, by the way, it doesn't have some sort of nose radar. It could hit you anywhere. Poison. Why would somebody knowing the bottle's going to blow up be standing here holding it? See, one of the things about working in science is understanding how to handle it safely. Is that how you prevent this bottle from blowing up? You. Fuck a hole, By the way, Bazinga. <laughs> At the end of the demonstration, it'll actually be detonated when he's about to see how powerful it really is. It is quite dramatic. Okay, we investigated the gas expanding. Now we're going to investigate what happens when you introduce the gas into it. What's going to happen to a balloon? It's going to pop. It's going to freeze. What's the frozen balloon like? Find out. Put it see in here. See there. Oh, oh, this is this is quite interesting. Yeah, it's going to change color. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, it's going to change. No, that's not it. Okay, wait a second. There seems to be a problem here. That, that's okay. Wait a second. 
How about, uh, no, no, okay, is that, that that's not it. Uh, is, uh, is this, uh, no, no. How about, uh, no, that's not it. Is it, uh, this, uh, yeah, no, no, okay, uh, how about, uh, no, no, no. Is it, uh, 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 uh. What color is that balloon that's over there? Yellow, there, oh, there it is. The air inside those balloons collapses that 700 times. Once you bring the balloons out, the air inside warms back up, re-expanding, re-inflating to the same shape size we before we started. That's the reason why all these balloons are up inside the container. Oh, by the way, in sort of an odd timing thing, um, I recently got done working on an experiment with Primulin, and this is the truth, okay? The name of that experiment is called the dark side. I was working for the dark side. <laughs> It's actually a cryogenic detector in Italy. If you want to Google that, you need Google Dark Side 50, otherwise you'll never find it in a million years. But when I was asked to join that experiment, I was told it was very tired from long hours and weekends. And I said, okay, if I join your experiment, what do I get out of it? You know what they said? They said, give me a lightsaber. I was expecting something other than a very, very lightsaber. By the way, I don't think these are very dangerous. I don't know big deal in the movie is. You can't hurt anybody with this thing, right? By the way, this is good for something. Very good at making cold cuts. Oh, well, you do know what this is, right? A it's a special type of puppy dog. No, it's a chili dog. Chili. I was. I was going to use um, this balloon here. Oh, it doesn't fit. Oh, wait a second. What if I help it along? As the air inside that balloon cools down, you'll collapse. Remember from the movie right by now, she's saying, Dorothy, you wicked little girl. As the air inside that balloon cools down, it collapses. Right in. What about a more rigid, a more rigid thing? There's an empty bottle with a regular cap. How about an even more rigid thing? This is an empty can. I sealed the top with tape, so I'll basically it's just a little bit of Oh, Now, one of the things that's interesting about this, um, what happened to the balloon when I brought it back out? It reinflated. It came back the exact same shape and size. A plastic bottle on my hands here, warmed it up. Plastic bottle, there I go. Comes back. Aluminum can. Does not. There's a reason for that. Some materials are permanently affected by the cold temperature. In this case, aluminum. Oh, oh, the, alu the aluminum actually becomes a stronger material. It's actually called cryo treatment. Very standard machine energy nowadays. The cryo feed your metal to make them stronger or whatever for certain applications. So if you ever see on that a uh, cryo treated on a product, that's basically what they did is dip it in the nitrogen and make it stronger. Whatever. Um, you'll notice when I'm working up here. It does kind of look like I'm reaching in these containers, and I can actually see where the liquid inside the container is. Um, I have different things for different jobs. I have these blue gloves. These are special trial handling gloves designed to handle extremely cold things. I have the dog, very good for like getting balloons in and out of the nitrogen here. But you think the hazard of this stuff is that you wouldn't want it to get on your skin. You wear some type of protective gear to protect your skin from contact. Now this black glove, for example, this is a special glove been guaranteed tested liquid type. So no liquid can get through this glove onto my hand. So this glove's perfect for me like, you know, reach in, grab the... Is this a bad idea? Yes. I mean, what's gonna happen? I figure this is gonna pop off? Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 no, I didn't actually lose anything. But this glove isn't really good at working in cryogenics. Because this love itself changes into something that's in fact much more like glass. Wow. Wow. In fact, why do you think I'm wearing this white glove? Because of the cold temperatures? No. Because why did that have glass? What would happen to my hand? I cut my hand. Do you know how hard it is to explain to people how you cut your hand on a rubber glove? So <laughs> but what would really happen if I put my hand in there? If I put my hand in there for a few seconds, I would get on my hand with a cold file. Very similar to a fire burn, saying body fills the odds going on. Back a few minutes later, all the skin would peel off my hand. Because it burned the skin off the hand, say, so anyway, so you're going to fire. 
actually ran in there for about five minutes. The wood free solid. Now we have to get rid of those TV shows, movies, see you do not shatter like glass. That's not where the body is. The bones stay Bob Strong's there now. But having said that, what in the world do I have to think of? Oh man. Why can I not put my hand container there? So I can hold my hand here. I can kind of demonstrate that with this. I have here, get it out of here, a track, what? Sorry about that. a track, and I have it to demonstrate a property of material, or uh, the back of this. What happens when I pour this liquid on this track? The reason why that goes running across that track that way is the same reason why. Bag back over here. Okay. What happened when I pour it on the table here? It goes running off the far side of the table. The reason it's running across the table that way is the same reason why I can hold it in my hand. See, if I was using a different liquid, let's say I was using water, and poured water on my hand, what would my hand get? What did the floor get? And it's not wet. Of course it's not wet. So what happened here? That liquid did not touch the floor, did not touch my hand. My hand, of course, so hot to it that it's boiling before it reaches the surface for another gas. It's actually called the linden frost or lightning frost effect, depending on who you talk to. And the surface of the thing is so hot that it's boiling before it reaches the surface for another air gas present kind of. See, the real hazard is not your skin. The real hazard is something that can actually absorb a liquid. This cloth is wet with nitrogen. That cloth against your skin. You transfer the cold temperature, giving you a burn. You have to go to a doctor, get a warp for enough, but these are the cotton cloth, the Q-tips, to transfer that cold temperature to kill whatever you're trying to get rid of. Now, I quite often get asked, by the way, a little background information. Fermi Lab allows me a couple of days of my work schedule to go to area schools to do this demonstration to promote science in the classroom. That's the reason I'm Mr. Freeze. Uh, after hours, weekends like this, they I volunteer my time for. But I quite often get asked whenever I do a demonstration at school, can I do that? And if you notice, okay, when I do this, I'm very careful not to toss it where I get on somebody else or toss it where I get on myself. So the only way to actually teach somebody how to handle ignition is what? Is if everybody in the area is naked. See, if you weren't wearing any clothing right now, this would be a perfectly safe demonstration, right? Oh, wait a second, wait a second. There's something else on your body absorbs liquid in there. There, yeah, see what happened to me? No, nothing to do with where you like it. This here is pretty neat stuff. This here is a four liter door for LD. Now, four liters is about uh, how much in US term? About a gallon of liquid nitrogen. How much do you think a gallon of liquid nitrogen costs? Is it like, you know, five bucks a gallon? No. 10 bucks a gallon? No. 20? No. Try $1 a gallon. In fact, in really large quantities, like we get a firm that, we get liquid nitrogen for 25 cents a gallon delivered. So why is it so cheap? First of all, where do you get it from? There. All of that nice time flowing around here is going in the air. You're breathing all in. Be so kind as we all like out again. It's just recyclable. By the way, this is government nitrogen. I do have to take accounting for everything. So please keep track of all your breaths so I can keep track of how much nitrogen is going in and out of here. Uh, secondly, what do we really need out of the air? Oxygen. Look at that. It's much more valuable. Much more commodity. Nitrogen is just a byproduct. Now, it's a good thing it is so cheap. We do use a lot of it there from that. Ever seen those big trucks? Each one of those trucks holds 7,000 gallons. Yeah. We use two of those trucks every day. But you know a company that uses more than we do. You've been, you've eaten your stuff frozen in the nitrogen. They probably should put a sign on the door right next to the clown's face. Yeah, Ronald McDonald used the nitrogen freeze at Hamburg you ate last week. Ever wonder why it looks the way it does? I know. That's all bad. Okay, first off, it's 25 cents a gallon. You freeze a lot of hamburger with 25 cents. Secondly, it's just nitrogen. You can dump a truckload of stuff directly on the food. And it will not affect the quality or safety of the food. And the third reason McDonald's Corporation does it, I can demonstrate this way. I put some water in this bag, and I'm going to add some of your nitrogen. Now, this kind of can demonstration in itself. I have in this bag two liquids. One liquid is boiling, while one liquid is freezing. One liquid is going from a liquid to a gas at the exact same. So, which one is boiling? Nitrogen. That's right. Which one's freezing? What am I making? Ice. By the way, ice, ice. Oh. it's so cold it makes ice scream. Oh, that came out wrong. Wait, 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 that uh, uh, screaming ice. We just turned around the other way. That worked out okay. 
Now this ice I am making here is regular standard water ice, uh, very odd shape to the way it was formed. It also has the property, you get a little small piece of this ice is so cold, this ice, there you go, freezes to my skin. It's so far below 32 that it freezes to me before I melt it. Same idea as you're trying to apply foam in the winter. Don't do that, it really works. If you want proof, I'll show you the movie again. And again, and again. But whenever I try to eat that ice, it freeze to my tongue, it'd be pretty painful, yeah. So what in the world would I be thinking of with a marshmallow? <laughs> Obviously you don't have a campfire up here, so I have to use the next best thing, which is the source of clear nitrogen. So now the question is, what do you do with a very well frozen marshmallow? Now some people have suggested I make s'mores. The problem is s'mores are supposed to be mushy and this is no longer mushy, it's not crunchy. So now the question is, what do you do with crunchy marshmallows? It's not make lucky charms. I'm really not sure what those things are, but actually, if you don't mind, um, I did not have a chance to have lunch. So if you don't mind, um, I just kind of have this as a snack. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should not be smoking in front of you kids. <laughs> well, that was smoking. That was fogging. It's okay to fog. But what is that? Why are there some marshmallows? One of the things about marshmallows that most people don't realize is marshmallows are back extremely good insulators. What insulators do is they don't transfer temperature all. That's because you insulate your house. You don't want the hot or cold from outside to the inside. Well, marshmallows are almost good as the insulation you have in your house. Don't go home and insulate your house of marshmallows. Look around the land. <laughs> But a marshmallow is such a good insider, it will not transfer the cold temperature to me well. So even just as cold as, as cold as the ice, I can take it out and eat it, and it will not give me a burn. Ice isn't near as good. It will transfer the cold temperature fast enough to give me a burn and be very painful. By the way, those that have seen the show before, I am sorry to say, but some of you have to say safety has told me I no longer can offer marshmallows at the end of the show. I do not know why they consider it a safety hazard, but they have deemed it a safety hazard. They no longer allow me to do that, so sorry. Um... I quite often get asked, why in the world we use so much liquor nitrogen there from that? And I demonstrate that a couple of ways. First off, I have here an electromagnetic coil, and there's a law called Lenz's Law, L E N Z, that anytime you put an electrical conductor, like this aluminum ring, into a changing magnetic field, it produces a current in that conductor, and that current makes it a magnetic field opposite one thing. So when I activate the coil, Whoa. now that's good. So we have firmly that just don't want good electrical current, we want great electrical. So I'm going to make this a better electrical current by doing this. By cryogenically freezing it, it will become a better electrical current. Oh, by the way, it's so cold, it gives goosebumps to a penguin. It's so cold, every picture it takes is a freeze frame. It's so cold, it gives uh, no, I forgot. <laughs> it gives um, the frostbite to a polar bear. There we go. Anyway, okay. Now that my ring has been cooled down to bright gen temperature, it now has become a better electrical corrector. And when I put it back in the same magnetic field as before, it will produce a higher current. And in this case, whoop, go much higher. The reason it's going higher is because it's producing a higher current, and therefore, by the way, if I let this warm up a little bit, will it go higher or lower? Lower. The more we connect it, the warmer it is. So you actually use this sort of an osmometer how high up it is to determine what temperature it's actually. If you could actually catch it. Yeah. What do you have? <laughs> uh, here, don't let me there. Okay. So that's now that's good. But we apparently that just don't want really good electrical colors. We actually want perfect electrical connection. I have here a special track, and this track is special in that this track is actually made of extremely powerful magnets. And I have it to demonstrate a, a property material. We use a lot of it for English. And that property is what we call superconductivity. Now, some materials, when they get extremely cold, become what we call superconductors. Now, most of those actually operate at minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. But a few very special ones, what we call high temperature actually operate at minus 320. This can has some of that material in it. Right now, no many properties at all. But once it gets cooled down to bright junk temperatures, it will become a superconductor. And when you put a superconductor into a magnetic field, you get what is called the Meissner effect related to Lenz's law. 
Oh, I almost forgot. It's so cold, it gives a sloshy brain freeze. It's so cold, it gives you brain freeze just thinking about it. Yeah. So now that my little can has been cooled down to try to it will become a superconductor. And when you put a superconductor in a magnet field, you get what is called the Meissner effect. And in this case, what that means is that my little can here, once it gets fully cold, it's almost there. There you go. It will, yep, a little bit better. Come on, a little more. There. Float on that magnetic field. So, this is a demonstration of magnetic levitation, the Meissner effect, and high temperature superconductors. As you see, it goes very easily because there's no resistance. The other thing's kind of neat is not only does it work this way, but it also works this way. So now that I write that up, but upside down. So that's a demonstration of the high temperature superconductor, the Meissner effect, and magnetic levitation. By the way, that also proves you can have a magnetic love train in Australia and it won't fall off, in case you're wondering. Hey there. <laughs> so, okay. Any questions, real quick, before I kind of more damage in the structure up here? Is it great or terrible? I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, next thing. You are good to go, sir. So, I'm live. So, if any of you have questions out there, feel free to ask me right now. Um, there's a little more of the video to watch, to some more entertaining things to see there. And then we'll have a couple of uh, things at the end. So, any questions you have out there? No? No, no, sir. It looks like that uh, there are no questions for you. If you want to, uh, if you want us to go back over to the uh, to the video. Okay. Yes, I do. Cold winter morning, 
that O ring got in there, it got pulled up and came from the front later to something that's in back. Much more. The O ring snapped from once, causing the gas to escape from the closing to the outside. This one was our permanent snake that makes the line closer. So I said, that's just a small material. What am I going to smaller piece of material that I have here? And now, in a bit of a reversal of fortune, we'll take my piece of icon. Yeah. The reason I think this is a far better idea than the banana hammer is that when the banana hammer warms up, what I have is banana punch. When this one, the white on the white on warms up, and I'm a couple of my hands like my swingy thing. This piece of white on went back. We gained flexible nature. So now I have invented the rubber nail. I cannot build up here what I'm going to build with rubber nails. I don't want my house doing that. Seems like a bad idea. Now they had suggested, well, how about building a house with an earthquake zone that works really well? Of course, those wind walls in your house are totally sideways. That's really bad. Now we in the Midwest or Texas could have some of this idea, of course, of our house having to get by tornado. We could drive the storm out. I my one patent of life out sticking out a first time someday. Okay, uh, next one, I'm going to do a little experiment. I'm going to do a little background demonstration first. I snake back here. Uh, I have here oops, a racquetball. A racquetball. A tennis ball. You can actually hear something quite unique in this setting if you listen carefully. Racquetball. Not that much. Tennis ball. That popping down here is actually thunder. How could that be thunder? What thunder is? Is a sonic boom caused by air expanding faster through the sun. A plane roll that the heat away will cause the air to expand faster. In this case, the small gas tail will cause the nitrogen faster. Same thing here. Sharp, not much, carpeting. That sound is in fact thunder caused by the nitrogen. The carpet makes the nitrogen expand for that. Now, I do this kind of a background demonstration, which is kind of interesting by itself. You ever wonder why certain sports don't catch on really big in certain parts of the world? This is a good example. Uh, Rackball, Alaska, not a good idea. If I got, you're probably going to be sorry. Uh, the Alaska Open, uh, not one of those big tour events on the old tennis circuit out there anytime soon. It's the best tennis ball. Uh, actually, in Alaska, they do not call it tennis field, they call it side ball. Everybody, that's all you're out here in the dock house. So, with that, uh, I can have a background demonstration. So, when I'm doing a science experiment, what you're actually trying to do is answer a question. So, in our case, our question is, what do you think is going to happen to this ball? Now, before you do your experiment, come up with your hypothesis. In our case, we can look at similar examples. Uh, we did a balloon. What happened to the balloon? What happened to it came back? We did a rack ball tennis ball. What happened to them? It got hard. It's going to collapse like the balloon. It gets hard like rack ball tennis ball. How many say it's going to collapse like the balloon? How many things going to get hot on Rabbi Tesla? How many are not voting in this election? Happy to hear you. It was our experiment. Now, the reason why the balloon collapsed is the air inside the balloon collapsed. Does this ball have air inside of it? Yes, it does. Okay, it collapsed. It got hot like Rabbi Tesla. Okay. But what happened to the air inside that ball? Does it still collapse? Yes, it did. It had to because it got cold. It had to collapse. So now I have a hard fill exterior with a collapsed gas or a vacuum inside. What does that make this like? No, I'm not voting. I'm pointing to a light bulb. Oh, what happens to light bulbs when you hit them? They explode. The reason why that ball explodes that way because it is just like a light bulb. You hit it and it blows into a thousand pieces all over the place. It's just like a light bulb. Okay. Hey, this next one. This next one is for you, ladies. No, I'm not going to flowers. But you, ladies, you know the connection between flowers and flowers and cryogenics, and it's something about flowers as well. Oh my, and you guys both freeze apart, you take flower face and rubber make give you rosy red cheeks. 
was down the road, right? What is that? Where do you get that pretty fiery smell? Perfume. So I can get a pretty fiery smell into the perfume. They do it this way. By fragile to freezing the flower. All the fragrance is lodged in the petals. Since the flowers can be taken up, the petals can be Fragrance process into perfume. Most flower based perfumes use fragile to process the fragrance out of the petals. Oh, by the way, it's as cold as the heart of a guy that would do that to a flower. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's it. I think you're ready again. Actually, um, if you don't mind, uh, I'm a little thirsty. Don't mind if I have a drink of my pop here. You know what? My pop. I don't like warm pop. Oh, oh, wait a second. I got three. I can take what, some of my little knife and stuff right in my little furnace here.
Um, a couple of things before I continue. Um, I do have a Facebook fan page website. There's some neat slow motion videos doing from the show up there. So check it out. I have a blue flyer there. Feel free to take one from Farm Base Rock, Biogenics, and all that. So check that out. Um, but now, kids, I want to be sure that whenever I do one of these demonstrations, do you get to leave this little demonstration with something? And it's not a petty shower like this. The third thing you get to leave this little demonstration with is a little science homework assignment. Actually, yes, 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 I would almost be willing to bet you that you'd have a hard time not. See, your homework assignment has to do with where I work, Fermilab. Fermilab's claim to fame is that we have the world's most powerful particle accelerator. We have to have one that shoots the particle right through the earth to Minnesota. So, how many of you have a particle accelerator at home? I have five in my house. I've had one. So now the question is, what in your what do you think you have in your house as a particle accelerator? Any idea? <coughs> I'll make it easy on you. You watch it every day. TV. Your TV's at your camera is electron. So sorry, so your homework assignment kids is to do what we do there at Fermi Lab, and it's not watch TV, okay? Oh, is to go home and operate your particle accelerator. You can handle that one, right? That's not a problem, right? <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you learned a little something one way, so thank you. I hope you enjoy uh, my life. Hope you enjoy that clip. Uh, we have another short little video clip to show you something I do at other presentations. I could not do it in that setting because of the uh, limitation of the room, but uh, this is uh, something I do in uh, schools, and it is a little more of a, a finale that I do for the show. It's partly to get rid of the liquor nitrogen I have left in, uh, from the show. So hopefully you'll enjoy this other curl. I hope you'd enjoy that. Now I have one uh, a little presentation that I can do here that I can't actually even do inside a gym. And that is um, the idea of you mixing water with liquid nitrogen. 
Now what I have is I have a one liter container half full of water and when you put nitrogen on top of here, the nitrogen doesn't mix through. It lies on top and boils a little bit, but not too much. What I'll be doing, I'll add some liquid nitrogen to this bottle. I'll then, what I'll be doing, I'll be turning it upside down. Well, now the nitrogen wants to go to the top or the bottom of the bottle at that point, and the water wants to go to the bottom. The nitrogen down boils very, very rapidly, making large amount of pressure. The water comes shooting out of the, the, oh, the opening, the top, and it rockets away. I'm going to step back from the camera here a little bit so you can see a little better. As I said, get my gloves on here. Okay. So, I'll be adding liquid nitrogen, turn it upside down, and we'll see it shoot away. And now, right. As you can see, there's no way you can do that inside a gym or inside a thing. It is very fast and it uh, goes quite far. So, is there any questions about what you've seen or from me in general, or Fermilab, or what we do here at Fermilab. Uh, so it looks like that there's a question from uh, Roger wants to know where you're located at, and what is that big white wall, uh, ball behind you? Okay, uh, I am, uh, we're Batavia, Illinois, where Fermi is a national lab, and uh, we have uh, about 1,800 employees, about 40 miles west of Chicago, and we are, uh, we have uh, a very large facility here. We actually have 6,400 uh, uh, acres of land that we actually operate on. What is behind me is in fact a old particle detector called a bubble chamber. It is actually 15 foot diameter. It has very powerful magnets inside of it that were used as a part of the system. And what, do I, what it would do is we would shoot particles at it and those particles would make the bubbles in the chamber is actually filled with liquid hydrogen. And those bubbles would then be photographed. Uh, what you see here is a piece of the film from that detector. And it took thousands and thousands and thousands of frames of these pictures. And those pictures had to be mapped out. All the little traces on their uh, picture had to be mapped out to determine what the tracks of the particles were. That's how we actually did particle physics years ago. Now it's all electronic and we can operate at much higher speeds because of the fact that it's all electronic. Hi, we're gonna start us soon. I have this chair with books because we need to be a little bit higher for the camera. Okay. I think it's a little too late. That is like I'm standing by. Uh, uh, it looks like there isn't any other questions. Is there any questions? Uh, that was the only one. Just a moment. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you can feel free to, to let everybody know where they can find you, like anything, social media, website, uh, okay. and then we can wrap up if you're ready. Okay. Um, as I said in uh, videos, I do have a Facebook fan yeah. page. Just get water. I was like, oh, my God. I can't believe it. Um, I uh, ha have a website that has, has some information about uh, the show and uh, the details of the show. Um, there's some videos on the Facebook fan page of the different parts of the show that you can possibly check out. Um, and uh, the, as the one video says, Fermilab provides this in the Chicagoland area free of charge. So area schools and area libraries can ask us to come do a demonstration to promote science in the classroom. And as part of sci uh, Fermilab science education outreach, we provide this free of charge to the area schools. And it's a, a great uh, benefit for the area schools in the Chicagoland area to have that uh, access to this uh, 
world-class science institution and us as uh, educators and uh, the science uh, people to come to the classroom and give these presentations. Awesome, awesome stuff. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Freeze himself, everybody check out all the amazing work he's doing. And that's going to wrap it up for this presentation. We'll be back in uh, about 10 minutes with our next one from the Pueblo Zoo. We'll see you all in just a few. Thank you.